Hello everyone. Happy Tuesday, August the 21st. I am uh, on location at, actually I'm on a place called Tubbs Hill. Tubbs Hills um, here in uh, uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And I've got Lake Idaho, Lake Idaho, Lake uh, Coeur d'Alene in Idaho behind me. It's a beautiful place, considered one of the prettiest lakes in America. And I would have to concur when they don't have smoke here, that it is very pretty, like today. The smoke has dissipated. And if you hear some screeching in the background, there are eagles up there. So I'll give you a little tour at the end of our show today so that you can see Tubbs Hill. People like jump off of uh, the cliffs here. I'm actually at the edge of one of the cliffs. And uh, it's going to be a great, um, great ministry time today. I love the topic. I've never shared on this topic before, so I'm looking forward to it. And uh, we will get started here shortly. Um, the last couple of nights I've been uh, doing ministry. I was up in Eureka, Montana on Sunday evening. And we had a great turnout. It was at a Church of God, a Chapel of Praise, and uh, have had a lot of testimonies coming in of people that have gotten set free and then delivered and then healed. A woman got healed of uh, asthma. That was a prolific Spartan racer, runner. Another one got healed of back and neck pains. Another one had a hip that shifted in the perfect position. Uh, she had been out her whole life. I think she was probably in her mid-30s and uh, the leg had lengthened, so a lot of miracles were happening. We see a lot of that when people get delivered. And then last night I was in here, here in uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and uh, again, another great night, great evening of people receiving revelation, understanding things that have gone on in their lives that they maybe have not understood in the past, and uh, some additional healings that have taken place there. So it was a great uh, evening. I love uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. It's one of the uh, favorite spots of vacationers and I can see why you know when there's not smoke here It's just a beautiful place. The lake is beautiful. They have a resort That by the way has an amazing uh, buffet for only $13 uh, All you can eat has uh, eggs scrambled eggs and pancakes and uh, fruit and oatmeal and uh, bacon and sausage and things like that so I have not eaten breakfast yet, so I'm planning to have brunch there. Um, very, very tasty. So anyway, that all being said, uh, I'm going to be talking on the subject today of the best leaders in life are never too proud to be servants. And that is something that I've, uh, I guess I look back at my own life personally. I never aspired to be anything in ministry, never aspired to be a leader really in anything. I was the third born in my family and typically third borns are like natural born salespeople or last borns also in the family why because they have to compete for attention compete for their voice you know typically the best uh, most likely candidates for those being like presidents of companies and leaders are going to be first borns because they are blazing new territory they have to lead the siblings and so forth so to be a last born and to be a leader is, I guess, somewhat of a rarity. And I do remember like in fifth grade, I was a spelling bee champ. Um, I was always uh, liked to read books. My mom would have me read books to her and I always enjoyed uh, a little bit of competitiveness there. And I never ran for any offices, you know, like, like our, I don't know, council that they have and president and any offices in schools. Never had a desire to do that. And it wasn't until my senior year of high school that I ran for an office for the very first time in my life. And that was to be president. And it was mainly because our president did not want to set up all the um, class reunions that were responsible for when you become president. So he ran for vice president. He was one of my best friends. He was really my best friend in high school and in middle school. And so his name is Pete. So he got to be vice president. I got to be president. And uh, it was interesting. I know that they have those titles that they vote on for, you know, best leaders and best this or that, uh, 
most attractive hair and things like that. And it was interesting that I was voted a couple of those. I remember, you know, I was actually voted best leader. I'm not sure why. You know, I just got along with a lot of people. I think that's the biggest reason why is I didn't rock the boat. I was nice to people no matter if they had any influence or not, if they were cool or if they were, you know, not. And uh, I loved on people. And then I also was voted, I guess, uh, what most likely to succeed, which uh, I don't know if uh, how you determine that over a lifetime, but um, I do feel very fortunate to uh, have gone through some of the things I've gone through. Um, but a lot of times uh, what I've learned as being a leader is you do have to, in fact, there goes a hawk. I don't know if you can see it or not. <laughs> um, Hawk Nelson, there you go. Remember that singer, Hawk Nelson? In fact, uh, I was at a, a house last night and they were playing a song by Hawk Nelson, so how funny is that? So we'll see if another hawk flies by or if an eagle flies by. I see a lot of eagles, or hear a lot of eagles up in the trees here making noises, so. Um, to uh, um, becoming a leader in my lifetime that you have to do a lot of sacrificing and laying your life down and you have to be humble because no one wants to be led by a person that's prideful, that's arrogant, it's no fun. I don't want to be led by someone like that. And uh, I've learned that you know, the best leaders in life are never too proud to be servants, to lay your life down, to be a servant. You know, and the, you, you think about it in the Bible, the word leader is used six times and the word servant is used 900 times. You know, that's a, an example right there of what we are supposed to do in our life is to, to be able to lead, yes, but also to be a servant and not to be above doing various menial tasks that maybe the, the uh, spirit of pride, spirit of Leviathan in you would try to cause you not to want to uh, take on, such as maybe you're too good to, uh, you know, clean toilets. I've cleaned toilets before. I've actually done that at a church when I was in uh, college uh, at Purdue. and. Um, you know, I'm not above that. I'm not above doing anything now that I've you know, given plasma like a couple of years ago um, when I needed money. The Lord humbled me, humbled me tremendously. All the money that I had, you know, I had about a half a million dollars. It was gone, completely gone. The Lord took it away so he could humble me so that I could then come into the leadership position the Lord has wanted me to come into at this point. So, but I had to lay my life down. I had to sacrifice a lot of things and it wasn't fun. And now when a leader views themselves above those they serve, then that spirit of pride rises up and normally pride goes before a fall. So eventually they will be humbled by the Lord and to be brought lowly so that they can ultimately get set free from that arrogant spirit of you know, cond cond condescension and so forth. So I'm gonna read uh, here what it says in the Bible, Luke 22, 24 through 30. It says, now there was also a dispute among them, which is the disciples, as to which one of them would be considered the greatest. And Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom just as my father bestowed one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So, you know, even Jesus obviously gave us an example that he was to serve. You know, he washed, you know, the disciples' feet and, uh, and he, he lowered himself to that. That was like one of the lowliest jobs that a person could do at that time was to wash someone's dirty feet and smelly feet because they've been walking in their sandals and they didn't have socks back then. They didn't have Nike gym shoes, so they wore sandals and they got dirty, dusty feet and they walked everywhere. They didn't have cars. So you can imagine, you know, I can imagine right now because I'm out here in the Northwest and there's a lot of places out here that are like deserty, that are very dusty. And uh, man, my shoes get completely dirty right now. My shoes are pretty dusty and I have to wash them, clean them off. So 
and you have to always, always be humble enough to admit that, okay, I can make a mistake. I don't know everything. You know, I can admit that. I don't know everything. You know, I've got a lot of experience, so I've gone through some stuff. That's the best trainer in life is experience. You can read all the books that are out there, but if you've never walked in those shoes, then it's really hard to lead someone. That's why I had to go through what I had to go through, you know, with my two wives, understanding the spirit of Jezebel and Leviathan, the subtle version and the extreme version. I had to learn that up close and personal. And again, I suffered from some of that as well, Jezebel, Leviathan, and Ahab. Most people do, but a lot of people are so prideful and arrogant, they'll never humble themselves to admitting that they have had any struggles with that. So, so determining whether or not a leader is acting from a heart of Christ-like service requires charitable, patient, humble discernment. You know, oftentimes I've noticed this and observed this, is oftentimes the best leaders that are out there never wanted to be a leader in the first place. You know, I never wanted to be a leader, you know. I'm fine with following people as long as they know what they're doing. Um, I surely did not want to do anything in ministry. I had no desires for that. My grandmother wanted somebody to be in ministry. I sure didn't want to do it. I just wanted to make a bunch of money and enjoy my life. Um, but I didn't, I couldn't do that. I had a lot of stuff I had to endure. I had a son that had uh, someone that, you know, showed him some things sexually he shouldn't and it messed his life up and it messed my life up for 10 years I endured a lot of hell uh, but that was training me allowing me to see that when a person gets you know sexually touched inappropriately or incest or abused or raped then those spirits of Jezebel Leviathan have a legal right to come in and start to whisper to the person that's why the people that have had sexual violations oftentimes develop the Jezebel spirit and they hear the voice of the enemy, causing them to not trust those of the opposite sex anymore, to control, manipulate, to try to pay them back for the pain that they hear in their voice every, every uh, or in their head every day. So think about other leaders that did not want to lead. Think about Moses. Moses did not want to lead the million crumbling people out of Israel, I mean out of, uh, out of uh, Egypt, you know, into their freedom. Why? Because he said he stuttered. He's like, I can't do this. He stuttered a lot. He didn't have, you know, the typical uh, leadership qualities, even though he grew up as a prince in Egypt. But when he actually left for 40 years and went into the wilderness, the Lord started to work on him so that he could prepare him for the position of leadership to take those people out. Um, so Moses did what he was supposed to do. Um, and oftentimes, greatest leaders out there, they have to sacrifice. They have to lay their lives down. You know, you see that, you, and you want to follow people like that. You want to follow people that are leaders. You want to follow people that are humble. Who wants to follow someone that's arrogant or that's being deceitful, that's, you know, privately sinning while they're telling other people not to, you know? You have to change. You have to repent. You have to become a different person. Um, I think about another great leader in the United States history of being Abraham Lincoln. You know, Abraham Lincoln had to go through one of the most tumultuous times of our country going through uh, the abolition of slavery and the Civil War. And a lot of people don't know this, but his uh, wife, Mary Todd, had a lot of demonic influence in her life. Uh, a lot of people would consider her bipolar. You know, she uh, suffered from a lot of headaches and a lot of mood swings, a fierce temper, it says, public outbursts throughout Lincoln's presidency, as well as excessive spending. So, uh, as a lot of the psychologists, historians said that she suffered from bipolar and that she had manic and depressive episodes. So you can imagine Abraham Lincoln trying to manage the country in such a tumultuous state and then having a, oh wow, I just saw a hawk dive into the water to get a fish. I have never seen that before. And here it comes now. <laughs> Wow, that was pretty cool. Oh, I'm gonna take you guys on a tour. It's actually up on the rocks right now. Wow, anyway. Anyway, can you imagine, uh, sorry about that, uh, about Abraham Lincoln, you know, having to endure all that stuff. So Matthew 20, 25 through 28 says, but Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, 
let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. <clears throat> so again, when the Lord had uh, indicated that I was going to marry my second wife, he said, you're going to love her like Christ loved the church. So I thought that was going to be a great thing. And then on my wedding night, I saw a different side of my wife. And the Lord said, well, yeah, you are going to love her like Christ of the church, but you're going to lay your life down for her in every way imaginable. You're going to have to take a lot of the pain that she's observed, you know, gone through in her life on yourself, and you can't tell anybody about it. So a lot of suffering was required in order to come into the ministry that I have now, and nobody wanted to do that. I didn't want to do that. Nobody wanted to do that, but it was a requirement. Um, and I'll say this, too, about other leaders. Um, you have to stay consistent because the enemy will try to tempt you, um, you know, especially men with sexual things, you know, especially being single now that I'm single for a while. I have to be making sure that I'm pure and righteous before the Lord. Otherwise, the enemy will have a legal right to come in to taint things in my ministry and come against me. You think about David. David was considered a great leader, one of the greatest leaders out there. He had a, a, a heart that was after God's own heart until he decided not to go to war when everyone else was going to war. Instead, he was looking out, gazing out, and seeing Bathsheba take a bath outside, being naked, where people could see her. He's thinking, why, why would she be doing that, you know? Well, she did, and then David saw her, and he summoned her and had sex with her, and of course, they had a child. The child ended up dying. David had consequences. You know, David had, you know, uh, a son, a future son, that actually tried to kill him. So you can imagine all the stuff that he had to go through. Um, he was a great leader, though. He had a heart after God's own heart, but he ended up uh, succumbing to uh, the enemy. So you have to make sure that you're always on guard. You know, I think about people that have titles. Up, oh, there goes the bird again. And now he's flying out further. Maybe you can see it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, wow, he's right there. Can you see him? He probably can. He's right there. That is cool. In fact, maybe I'll show you. I think I'll show you. Let me flip this. Mm -hmm. There. I believe that's a hawk. I'll call you Hawk Nelson. Hello, Hawk Nelson. All right, back to the show. So funny. All right. There we go. <laughs> the dangers of doing a Facebook Live out, out in Idaho where there's plentiful birds and fish and uh, wildlife. All right, back to the uh, topic of the day. Oh, yeah, how many people do you know that have titles in their names and they like to be used to have those titles like spoken to them? Like I always consider my title being Nelson, a kid from a cornfield. You know, that's where I grew up at. You know, I wanna stay humble. I wanna stay in my roots, you know, of humbleness. I gotta stay that way. I can't be prideful and arrogant. I used to be prideful and arrogant but I gotta not be that anyway. So a lot of people say, well, how should we introduce you? Are you prophet? Are you, uh, what else do they call me? Uh, apostle or something like that. I'm like, no, I go, maybe I operate in some of these stuff, but I'm like, I'm a kid from a cornfield. Just call me Nelson, you know, that's who I am. You know, there's kids that see me all the time and they're like watching me on Facebook Live. They're like, ah, oh, there's Nelson. So then I, when I actually visit them, in real life, they can come up to me, and I love kids. Kids are awesome. You know, I, have, I act like a kid myself, so that's what we want to be, is to be humble. But a lot of people call themselves like, I'm an apostle, or I'm a bishop, or I'm a whatever. I'm a president. I'm a CEO. You know, really stop it. Lower yourself. Humble yourself. You know, go by your first name, you know. Just like Jesus. Jesus is like, hello, hey, I'm Jesus. So, you know, again, we do not want to... Uh, you know, we don't want to have pride in our lives. So, um, anyway, so leaders are good also. They're emp empathetic or emp empathic, empathic listeners. They have empathy for people. You know, and they can have sympathy as well. Uh, but empathy is simply understanding and having compassion on a person. 
and realizing that maybe I didn't go through what you went through. You know, obviously we're all different, we all have different paths, but to have empathy for someone if they're hurting and to love them like Christ loved the church. You know, you wanna be directed, this is important too, is, um, you know, leaders are best if they can hear the Lord's voice and do what God tells them to do. How many people are out there leading in churches and they, you know, may preach other people's sermons and they don't uh, hear from the Lord. Up oh, here comes another bird. Really, one. With, I'm gonna show you this one. Maybe. Very cool. I don't know what that one is. It had a very big wingspan, though. All right. See, there's the uh, resort and all the boats and stuff. Yep, yeah, could be an osprey. I don't know. But I hear a lot of that noise the last uh, hour that I've been here. Um, all right, back to the show again. So, um, you know, leaders obviously are best if they hear from the Lord for themselves. You know, who wants to follow someone that does not hear from the Lord? You know, I remember, uh, I'll say this, I remember attending a, uh, a pastor's meeting that met, met like on Thursday mornings. I was invited to come. There was like a group of like 15, 20 pastors from some local churches north of Indianapolis. And uh, I was used to like getting words from the Lord, you know, and so they apparently never did or never could. And I couldn't understand that. I'm like, wait a minute, you're a pastor. I'm like, you don't hear from the Lord? How do you preach? You know, and like, I don't think any of them said that they could hear from the Lord. And I'm like, well, then how in the world can you preach? I don't get that. You know, I'm like, I wouldn't want to be a preacher and a pastor if I didn't hear from the Lord, because then if I'm speaking words out to try to convey to my flock and it's just myself and it's not the Lord, then I'm going to maybe mislead them. I don't want that. So anyway, it's kind of floored me uh, because I would get words from the Lord and I would speak it out and they're like, oh my gosh, never heard that before. And that's really revelatory, whatever. So anyways, um, you want to make sure you follow leaders. And if you are going to become a leader, don't ever have pride. Don't ever have pride. Humble yourself. Be a servant. Um, James 4, 6 says, But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. James 4, 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. And again, if you don't humble yourselves, he'll humble you. I've seen it. I've seen a pastor that had a church of 200 people, and he was very prideful, very arrogant. And actually, the Lord had me con convict him to confront him, essentially. And he was preaching there was no such thing as a Jezebel spirit, and it was being very arrogant and prideful. He preached that there was, you know, if you go to hell, God loves you so much, he'll give you one more chance to get out, or he'll burn you up because he loves you. Well, he lost the church. He wouldn't humble himself. He lost the church from 200 people down to 20 within a year. So, and I'll read finish with this first chronicles 28 9 through 10 as for you my son solomon know the god of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind for the lord searches all hearts and understands all the motives and the intents of the thoughts that's important god knows your motive god knows your intent you know you may try to appear godly pure you know, trying to help other people in the church. But if your intent and motive is to get yourself into position of leadership and you've not humbled yourself, the Lord knows that. The Lord searches your hearts and your minds, it says. It says that also in Revelations 2, 18 through 23. It talks about, you know, the church of Thyatira and the Jezebel spirit and how he knows and he searches the hearts and the minds. And it says, I'll put you on a sickbed and kill your children if you're going to be operating in that spirit of Jezebel. So... So anyway, what first I just read, read was First Chronicles 28, 9 through 10. And again, you can uh, watch this on a rerun. So if you don't catch this live, um, and there goes a seagull. 
Anyway, I'm gonna give you guys a tour of this place because if you guys have never been to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho and the lake, I would highly recommend it because this is an amazing place. So let me, let's see, I'm gonna do this. I'm going to, in fact, I'll show you this. Yikes, don't fall off. Oh my gosh. There goes a birdie. Wow. Pretty sure that was a hawk. Anyway. Another hawk. Wow. This is fun. Wow. I like this place a lot. Okay. And okay, now I am going to pop this off of this. In fact, I could probably leave it on it now that I think about it. Let me do that. Let me just flip this around. There we go. Let me go for a walk and let you guys have a tour. First of all, again, this is just part of the lake. It's beautiful here. Beautiful when there's no smoke. And over there is where the marina is. Now I'm gonna show you this is what I'm looking at. We'll see what kind of wildlife we run into. They do have bears mountain lions and eagles oh. you have to climb to get up out of here If you have walking paths up and down this mountain. I guess it's a hill. It's a pretty steep hill. making that sound. I don't even see it. Wow, kind of a strange bird. I don't see it, but I hear it. Yes, I am at Hub. Not, no, I'm not. Tubbs. Tubbs Hill. Yeah, Tubbs, not Hubs. Might be a squirrel. I think it is. It's a squirrel bird. Wow. Rarely seen in Idaho is the squirrel bird. I see it now. It's up there making a loud noise. Okay, so here we are. I feel like a Little Red Riding Hood on the way to Grandmama's. Oh. Hey, and there's a uh, some fowl up there, moving. Maybe I can zoom in here, you can see them.
I don't know what kind of birds those are. Turkeys, maybe. I think they're turkeys. So they get to hide out here till Thanksgiving. And then they take one for the team. Okay. As you can see, the lake's right over there. And the uh, hill slash mountain is up here. I'll take you on a walk back to the uh, marina. Isn't it pretty? So pretty. Feel like I'm on vacation every day. God told me it would be worth it in the end going through what I did and and it has been. I've enjoyed, even though it's not fun sometimes dealing with people that have Jezebel because they lie and twist and manipulate and lie more <laughs> and abuse and control and are prideful, but you get to enjoy smelling pine trees and uh, seeing wildlife. It's fun as long as you don't fall off the cliff. Stephanie Hughes is watching. Hello, Stephanie from Kentucky. Look at this. Look how dangerous this is. Ah! I'm on the edge of a cliff. Here. Some boats out there. I love boats and jet skis, especially. Yesterday it was really foggy. I'm actually it's Sunday. Sunday was the worst fog here. Today is the clearest it's been in the last week. The beautiful water. All right, back to the path. Shall I step closer to the edge? What am I doing? I'm having fun, Stephanie. Whoa! As long as I don't slip and fall. Look at those big rocks. With great leadership comes great responsibility. I just heard that from the Lord and it's true. A lot of times people uh, don't want to be responsible and they want to lead. Whoa. I'm on the edge. Ah, uh, Lake Coeur d'Alene, it's beautiful. That big pine tree. Okay, back to walking again. Hey, we see some people now. Hello. Hey there. People. I saw people. Oh. Now 
we go back up this way, I think. Look at those big rocks. Those are like giant, weigh at least 50 pounds. Or 50,000. Which way do I go? I don't know. Maybe this way. Somebody is gaining on me. Oh, wait a minute. I don't go this way. I go this way. Hey, there's people swimming over there. Cool. Yes, I was being facetious with the 50 pound comment. There's a bunch of seagulls out there. I could just start uh, doing somersaults downhill here and I would end up in the water. See, there's uh, people swimming over there. Let me see here. I don't want to go down this way. I want to go across this way. I think he's lost. Let's see, I'm gonna go up here. Uh, here we go. There we go. Maybe I'll run into a rattlesnake. They always seem to cross my path lately. And I can take a rock and crush its head. Working up a good appetite for the brunch since I've not had any breakfast. Pretty. How do I know if I'm on the right trail? I don't. I just sense. If it doesn't make sense, I go a different direction. This is where people jump off. Does Don live by here? Don Casanova Linegar lives about uh, two hours and 40 minutes from here. Autumn is the one that lives like 30 minutes from here. Autumn works in Coeur d'Alene and she lives in Spokane Valley, Washington. But she uh, works here in Coeur d'Alene. I wonder if I go down this way without slipping off and falling 100 feet into the water. Again, this is considered the most beautiful lake in America, Coeur d'Alene. And I concur, it is. No other lake in America is as beautiful as this one. You all need to come here. Great place for a uh, honeymoon too.
Okay. Let's see. Boss, the plane, the plane, the plane, the plane. A little bit of a fantasy island humor there. like that tree on uh, Karate Kid, <clears throat> except a little bit bigger, the bonsai tree. Okay, back up the hill here. We're almost back to uh, the uh, resort. And I haven't fallen and skinned my knee yet. Whoa, almost did there. Uh-oh, here comes a bird. Wow, it's Hawk Nelson again. Making diamonds. Remember that song? Diamonds out of dust or something like that. Oh my goodness, ouch. Let's see here. Okay, now where are the bears at? We haven't seen the bears yet. And the mountain lions. Oh, this is gonna give me such an appetite so I can eat buffet. Mmm, best buffet in the world. For only $13 too. Can't beat the price. Uh, doggies. Morning. Morning. More doggies. Hello. Hi. Hey, an airplane's taking off. Cool, let's watch the airplane. Let's see about okay. All right, we're almost back. Almost. Ah. There's another bonsai tree. A ginormous bonsai. Wipe on. Wipe off. Remember Karate Kid? Ha! Funny. It's beautiful. Just beautiful. On Fantasy Island. Maybe that's the love boat. With Julie Toos. I think she was the uh, woman that uh, was the pretty one on there. Okay, here we go. We're almost back. Almost. I can taste the buffet. Whoa. Okay. Uh. Okay. 
Okay, and here we are. We are done. Back at the resort. Hey, there's a moose up here. Let's go say hi to the moose. Alrighty, back to safety. There's the resort where all the boats are at. And that completes the tour for the day. Boys and girls, again, to be a leader, sometimes you sacrifice and serve. And you never complain. All righty. So I will let you guys go. Have a great day. Be a leader. Don't complain. Have a servant's heart. And have fun. See ya. Love ya. Bye.